Okay, this is Chapter 5, Time Value of Money, TVM, as it's often labeled. This is an extremely important chapter. It's a chapter that the material will, will show up in the rest of the course. Um, you're going to need to know this intuitively. You're going to need to understand this material rather than memorize it. It's going to be impossible for you to, to try to do the problems that I'm going to show you through memorization. You're going to have to understand it to be able to work the problems. In this video, I'm going to cover uh, future value of a lump sum, symbol just FV, the future value of an annuity, the annuity meaning a series of equal payments, then we're going to look at the present value of a lump sum, and a lump sum is simply a single payment, and then a present value of an annuity, and then we're going to look at um, some miscellaneous items related to this. Uh, for example, we'll be looking at um, nominal and nominal interest rates, effective interest rates, uh, effective annual rates, um, and then we'll get to amortizing loans, such as mortgages, student loans, auto loans. It's an extremely important chapter, not just uh, for this course, but in the real world. The real world works with the time value of money financial world, the banking industry, the insurance industry, the stock market, the bond market, the business world in general works off of the time value of money. And having an understanding of it is extremely important for a business degree. So with that, with that in mind, let's start right here with the future value of a lump sum. Best way to introduce the material is to give you an example. Okay. So here we have an example. Suppose you deposit you deposit a thousand dollars today in a CD. Okay, certificate of deposit with a one year maturity. A CD is basically you're opening up an account with a bank or a savings and loan or a credit union and um, you plop the $1,000 in there, it has an associated interest rate. In this case, let's say the interest rate is 10%. I use a pretty high interest rate only so you can see visually the, um, the magnitude of the, of, of the interest compounding. <clears throat> Today's world, CD rates are much, much lower than that. So the question is, how much in one year is this worth? So we basically have a maturity of one year. You deposit $1,000. It grows at 10%. It's really the growth rate of the balance. We're not going to withdraw anything. With CDs, you, you deposit the money and you just leave it in the account until you withdraw the entire amount the CD um, expires, terminates. So how much is it worth in one year? Well, it's 1,000 times 1 plus the interest rate in decimal form means it's $1,100. And with $1,100, um, you get, you, you're going to get your $1,000 principal back and $100 is associated with interest income. Now, the next question is, what happens in two years? Well, you take this $1,100 and then you multiply it by 10% because money compounds, it snowballs, and you got $1,210 after two years. Then the question would be, well, what happens if it was three years? Well, 1.10 times 1.10 times 1.10 equals 13.31. So after three years, you get your $1,000 principal back, and you're going to get $331 in interest income. As you can see, the interest, the interest is accumulating over time. Now, there is a general formula for this, and the formula is looks like this. It's future value equals the present value times 1 plus i to the n power. Okay, And so what this is, this is present value. You're going to have to get comfortable with these terms because you're going to see them throughout the semester in this chapter. Present value is the amount of money that you have today. What is the amount of money that you have today? What is it worth? I is the interest rate specified on an annual basis. 
n is the number of years, compounding periods. In this case, it's years. And then what pops out of the equation is the future value. So coming back to here, the $1,000 was the present value in each one of these cases. And then we compounded it over n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. So what happened was, let's do this example. We took $1,000 and we took 1.10 1 to the third power and we will come up with 1331 as the future value. And that's not so bad. Now what we need to do is understand how to compute this on a calculator, time value of money calculator, like I have right here. Um, many, like I said earlier in the earlier video, many of your calculators, even the big ones, uh, they may not be explicitly a financial calculator, but they have a mode somewhere in there, a mode that does time value of money. And so what you need here is look carefully Time value of money mode, a calculator with time value of money means you have an N for the number of periods. You have an I slash Y is the interest rate per period, right, per year. And that's this basically, the calculator is calling it I slash Y. PV is present value. Payment, in this case we have no payments, we're not there yet, we don't have an annuity, so the payment equals zero. Um, and then a future value, FV. So you, you should have somewhere in your calculator something that looks like that. It'll be extremely helpful. It's not absolutely necessary, but when you get done this, you'll realize that it, you really need um, a financial calculator. It'll help you significantly in the course. Okay, so now let's actually um, hit, hit the calculator buttons and come up with the, um, let's do this, future value equals present value times 1 plus i to the n, and we're going to go over this example. Three equals 1331. So, let's start it up. Turn on the calculator. And by the way, when you turn on your financial calculator, I don't know if you can see this, it may not come out too well. Um, in, in a video, but you need to make sure that you have one, you have the right number of decimals going across. If you have only two decimals to the right of the decimal, two, two digits to the right of the decimal, you probably need to expand that. And the way you do it is you hit second format, so you hit the second button, get in out of this mode, see this yellow button right here? You hit the second button, and the format is where the period is, right down here. So you hit second format, and then it'll say DEC for this example. DEC means decimals. Right now I have it set for five decimals. If I wanted to change it to seven, I'd hit seven and then enter. And then I have seven digits to the right of the decimal. Okay, that's, that's far more than enough. Two is not enough in this course, so set your calculator so that you have at least four digits to the to the right of the decimal, at least four. Um, one other thing, when you get your calculator, it's, if it came right out of the package and you haven't used it before, you want to make sure the payments per year, P slash Y, is equal to one in our calculations. And the way to do that is you hit, in this case, you hit second, the, the yellow button, second, and it gets you into the, into the yellow mode, so to speak and you hit P slash Y, and if you can see that on my calculator, I'm not sure if you can, you can see that, what, um, what you're seeing is P slash Y equals one, and then it goes over seven decimals, because I just turned it to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I just turned it to seven decimal places to the right. Okay, so you want payments per year to be one and that will help you significantly here. Okay, so we got that out of the way. You got, you got enough digits to the right of the decimal and you have payments per year one. Um, now you're ready to begin the this, um, calculator exercise. So we want N equals three. So you hit um, three and then you actually have to do it backwards in some cases. And you'll have to fiddle with your calculator until you get comfortable. But you hit three, 
and then you hit N and um, that's sufficient to get it in there, 3N. That means N equals 3. Um, then you're going to want to put in 1,000 and you put in 1,000. I'm going to type in 1,000 and then I'm going to hit um, present value. So I hit one, I typed in 1,000, hit present value, and uh, it'll tell me that I have a $1,000 present value. Okay, so I got that out of the way. The payments are going to be zero. As I said, this is only a lump sum. There's no annuity. There's no series of payments. So zero equals payments. So I'm going to hit zero and then payment here. And I hit zero in payment. And then um, I need to get the interest rate in there. So then I hit 10. And the interest rate will be put in as a, in decimal form. So you just, or not in decimal form, percent form. So you just put a 10 in, not point one, a 10. So I hit 10, hit um, I slash Y. Interest rate per year is 10. And it knows that it's a percentage. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say compute um, future value. So at this point, I'm going to say compute, which is this button right up here. And then I'm going to hit future value, which is this button here. So compute future value. It blinks. And it gave me a minus 1331 one, with seven decimal places off to the right. Now, you might ask, well, why is there a negative sign? Well, you're going to have to get comfortable with your calculator here. Um, your calculator assumes that you have cash flows coming in and you have to have cash flows going out. And if you don't have cash flows going in and cash flows going out, your calculator doesn't know what to do. So it, it, will, um, it will flip signs around um, depending on what you input. Now here's the thing. When we input present value of 1,000, we implicitly put that in as a positive number. That means we deposited $1,000 into an account. So you can think of it that way. And we received 1,000, and now we can withdraw 1331 out of it. Another way to do it is, and maybe more, maybe more intuitive for you, would be to put the present value in as a negative number. So if you were to put the present value in as a negative number, out would pop 331, positive. So that means you deposited and you cash flow went out of your pocket, so to speak. You put it into an account, and when, they, when all was said and done, you can withdraw $331 out of the account, positive cause positive cash flow money into your pocket okay so get comfortable with that your calculator becomes really handy if for example you want to go out many years um, <clears throat> if uh, and I guess it, in this case it's not too bad um, in this case it's not too bad get that out of the way um, if you wanted to go 30 years so n equals 30 I slash Y is 10 present value let's put it in as minus a thousand and I'm going to say payment is zero and then I'm going to say compute future value and that will pop 17449 with seven decimals to the right okay and it'll come out positive um, you could do that mathematically simply by saying, look, 10,000 or 1,000 times 1.10 to the 30th power equals 17,449. So at a 10% interest rate over 30 years, you're going to make 7,440 uh, more. No, you're going to you're going to earn um, 16. Thousand four hundred and forty-nine dollars worth of interest, and that's the effect of compounding. That's what you want to take advantage of while you're young. If you have the ability to put money into the market, either bonds or stocks, preferably at your age, um, meaning under under 30 years old, you want to put your money in the stock market. As we'll study, the stock market earns you know ballpark 12 percent per year on average, and has done so over the past 80 years. Then you can imagine what happens over over the years when you make as you start depositing money. It accumulates significantly. So 
then it makes your retirement that much easier. Okay, so that was the future value of a lump sum. Now what we want to do is calculate the future value of an ordinary annuity. Future value, ordinary annuity. And what I mean by an ordinary annuity is that the cash flows come at the end of each period. That means ordinary means at the end of each period. Your calculator automatically assumes that, as you'll see in a, in a little while. But basically, here's the point. We've got to start with a timeline, and this timeline is extremely important to draw, to get your head around what's going on. I've been doing this for a long time, and I still need timelines. Uh, I find that I don't need them. I, they're, they're extremely helpful in, in organizing my thought process on it. So um, what happens is with an ordinary annuity, you got a series of payments over a period of years, Let's say we got five years. So we're going to have payment here, payment here, payment here, boop, payment, and payment. Okay. And so what we want to do is we're going to ask the question, well, how much is, when you have all this money, this first payment here, it's going to, you can use your finger here, this first payment is going to be invested for this year, this year, this year, and this year. It's going to be invested for four years. Okay. And then this payment will be invested for three years. This payment, third payment, will be invested for two years. The second to the last will be invested for one year. The last payment doesn't get invested at all. It's a time is zero, so there's really no time for compounding. And so there's no compounding of money with that last payment, but it needs to be included in the calculation. So the general formula for this, if you wanted to put this into a nice, neat formula, um, the formula looks like this. The future value of an annuity for n periods equals your payment times 1 plus i to the n power minus 1 okay, all over. That's an exponent. The n minus 1 is not an exponent. Divided by i. That is the general formula. For an end period ordinary annuity where the payments, they don't start at the beginning, like the first, it was starting at the beginning, the first payment would start here at time zero today. So we always, when we draw our timeline, we almost always start off today at time zero. And this is the end of one year, the end of two years, the end of three years, and so on. That's the general formula. Um, so let me give you an example working this. So here's the example. Write this down as we go. Congratulations, you just won the lottery. The payout is $50,000 at the end of each year over the next five years. $50,000, that's the payment. It's a series of payments. $50,000 okay. at the end of each year for the next five years. And one, two, three, four, five, right there. Okay, now the problem goes on. It says, since you're currently 60, let's say you're 60 years old, you decide to invest each payment, okay? At age 65, you hope to retire with a handsome sum from this annuity. Remember, an annuity is a series of equal payments, 50,000 in this case. Assume that the bank will guarantee you a rate of 6%. I slash y, 6%. Okay, n, remember it's 5, so write down the, the important stuff here. And then um, how much money will you have in the bank at age 65? So it's asking you, what is the future value of this annuity over n periods, which is 5? Okay, notice we got four of the components that we need. The only thing we're missing is we don't have any present value here because the present value is zero. We don't really have a present value. It's zero here. You got nothing today. One year from now, you'll get these payments. So you start with a series of payments, okay? So what's happening is, let's see if I can draw this out here. I'm gonna chop off the zeros to make it manageable. 
I redraw my timeline. So what I'm going to do is, and by the way, you should, um, if you notice, I try to put the cash flows up top above. You should be systematic, in other words, so that you're organized and putting these timelines together. Um, so here I put 50, 50, 50, 50, and that's where I put my cash flows across the time, across this time series here, this timeline. Now, what I want to do is um, I'm, I'm going to show you that this formula works. And so this is a nice shortcut formula because, boy, if you had 30 years, you'd be a lot, you'd have a long timeline on a lot of calculations. So let's see that this 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 works. So, okay. so let's take this 50,000 and treat it as a lump sum. If you took this 50,000, $50, and you multiplied it by the 1.06, 1 plus that interest rate, and you went one, two, three, four periods, it would be worth 63.124. Okay. Now I'm I'm back to um the the you know this is sixty-three thousand and hundred and twenty-four dollars. I want to keep I want to keep it out three decimals to the right here. So the first cash flow gets compounded four periods of six percent. The second cash flow, fifty times one point oh six to the third, gets compounded three periods. That's fifty nine point five five one. The next cash flow gets compounded over two periods, and that's fifty six one eighty. Second to the last, fifty times one point oh six. You don't really need to put anything here. You can put it to the one power, but it doesn't do anything mathematically. 53,000 plus you need to add that last number. And mathematically, you could just say 50,000 times 1.06 to the zero power. And anything to the zero power is itself. And so when you add this up, oops, put these, these are decimals here. When you add this up, you get 281. 0.855. In other words, if you get, uh, if you win the lottery and you get fifty thousand dollars for each of the next five years at the end of each period, and the bank will pay you six percent, if you invest that money, it will compound to two hundred eighty-one thousand dollars. That means you basically earn thirty-one thousand eight hundred fifty-five dollars. You know, just subtract two fifty. This adds up to two fifty. So you subtract the 250, you made $31,855 in interest income from this. Okay. Now let's make sure the formula works. So here we're going to say the payment, put it in as a 50 here. 1.1, oh, 06, 06 to the um, fifth power minus 1 over 0.06. And we do that, we get 50 times 5.6371. That equals 281.855. And there you have it. You don't have to go through the tedious calculation here, but the tedious calculation gives you the intuition as to what this big formula does for you and what this formula does. In another video, I'll derive this, but you don't need to know how to derive this formula. It's not hard to derive, you know, something about infinite series and, and series in general. Um, but you're not expected to know that. So, there we have it. Um, let's verify it a third way. So, when you do this on a test, and you'll be, you'll, you certainly will do something like this on a test, mm -hmm. these types of problems. You can, you can do things by hand here the long way. You can have the shortcut formula method here, or you can do it by calculator. And here's what you do for the calculator. N equals five, All right, plug N equals five. Let me do that along as I speak, five N. And then um, I slash Y is six. So I'm gonna say six I slash Y. Um, 
present value is zero. And again, there's no present value. We have no money starting today. So zero present value. Um, payment. Now, uh, payment you can put in as a positive or a negative here in this case. And you're going to really have to get comfortable and just be able to interpret when things come out positive or negative out of your calculator, you're going to get positive or negative results. You just need to be able to interpret what that means. It won't be that hard when you, when you, you know, if you know the context of the problem. So the payment in this case is going to be, you can imagine putting $50,000, right, in an account, depositing, and asking how much am I going to get back out of that account. And so the, the future value will be positive. So now you got four out of the five components. Now the only thing you don't have is future value of the annuity. So you compute future value. Okay, so notice this time we put in a payment. And that payment says it's telling the calculator that this is an annuity. So put in zero, I gotta put in the fifty thousand, and you can put the negative in there by hitting the plus minus sign. And then I put that in as a payment, and then I hit compute future value and out pop 281 854 and 65 cents basically okay. and um, there you have it confirmation that it works but you got it to the exact decimal in this case so there you have it future value of an annuity so we want to move on now to a you know, this, we're going to move on and um, to what's called an annuity due, a future value of an annuity due. We're looking at the future value of an ordinary annuity. Remember, ordinary annuity means the payments happen at the end of each period. So you start at time zero, and they go at the end of each period for five years. Right? So let me do a comparison. What we want to do is look what happens when we have a future value of an annuity due, which means the payments are um, at the beginning. So let's look at the ordinary. Five. Five periods. And with an ordinary, we just covered it. Payment, payment, payment at the end of each period. Now, with an ordinary, with an, an annuity due, as it's called, they're sometimes called an annuity in advance. So due or advance starts out same time, same timeline basically, but the payments happen here. So you. It's as though this whole time series right here gets shifted to the left by one period. You still have, in this case, five. If n equals five, five payments. But they're all shifted to the left, which means you get your money sooner rather than later. And the way to do that, so your calculator is, is geared and is wired, basically, it, to handle an ordinary annuity. That's the default setting. If you want to start getting into annuity due, and we'll do this with both a future value and a present value shortly, is you need to go to your calculator and hit second, get into the yellow mode, hit the second button right there, and then hit the begin button right here. The yellow thing that says BGN. So you hit second, begin, and then second, set. And then you'll notice, so I'll, do, I'll write it out. Second, begin, second, set, and then hit enter. And you will see oh, BGN on your screen in big letters on the left. And you also will see it, not only will you see it, so if this is your screen, I'm not sure if you can see it here, you'll have BGN in your calculator, but off to the very upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little BGN up in the upper right-hand corner. Don't ignore that. 
Because what that little BGN is telling you is your calculator thinks, is thinking in this mode. It's thinking this is going on. And if you have a problem that's an ordinary annuity, you're going to come up with the wrong answer. So you want to make sure that you're in, an, in a do or beginning mode if you have an annuity do or an advanced annuity. <clears throat> and you can undo this by hitting second, um, second set. You can hit second, begin, second, set and hit enter to make sure it sticks and you have it and it'll be in um, back to the original ordinary annuity so let me get back to that I want to get back to a beginning mode okay <clears throat> now let me do it by hand and then I'll show you the trick on how to get to it um, in, in a shortcut formula method. So let me show you the mechanically the hard way of doing it, the intuitive way of how it works, and then I'll get to the, the formula, which is a bit simpler. One, two, three, four, five. We're going to get 50 starting today. So basically, let me read the problem here. It's the same problem, except the, it's a beginning annuity. So assumes, assume you, you've won this lottery and you get $50,000 per year at the beginning of each year instead of at the end of the year for the next five years. What is the value of the annuity at the end of five years? So it's asking, what is it worth at the end of five years? But the payments are all shifted to the left. And so notice, there's still five payments. Five payments, that's important, but they're shifted to the left. But you're asked at year five, how much is it worth? Well, take this number and compound it. Make it snowball at 6% for one, two, three, four, five periods, five years. That is worth 66,911. Take the next one. 50 times 1.06 to the fourth power, one, two, three, four. And you get, oops, 63.124. And you just continue. And you continue, and you continue. And we get 298.766. Wow, that's different than the 281 we got. Remember, we did the 281 back here with an, with an ordinary annuity. But now, look, we got an extra 18 grand on this one. So how's that coming about? Well, this is the old story. Is you, you basically, the, the old conclusion is you want your money sooner rather than later. Because when you get your money sooner, ignoring risk issues, you get to compound the money a whole extra period. So you're getting compounding a whole extra period, and you're gaining $18,000 because of that. So all else being equal, you want your payments up front now rather than later. The whole financial world works on, those, on that concept. And it's basically the opportunity cost. You rather, you know, it, it's cost. Whoever you're getting the money from, this fifty thousand you're getting from the state, the state would rather hold on to that money and earn six percent. They give it to you a year early. You're earning the six percent instead of the state. And so, um, if you can get your money early, you get to earn that interest. Otherwise, there's there's a cost to you in in allowing your money to be delayed in payment. So delay in payment as a cost. And this is this shows up in um, you know all sorts of contracts. So you want to buy a, a phone or you want to buy a car and you have to make payments. You can pay for it all lump all up front and pay, you know, $25,000 for a car or you can pay it out over a series of 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 years in which case there's going to probably be an interest rate associated with that and the sum of those payments are going to add up much higher than $25,000. So you rather get your you rather pay late 
and receive your money sooner is the way to is the way to operate in the business world. Get your money as fast as possible in your pocket. Delay payments as much as possible, especially when interest rates are high. It has a significant impact. Now, um, okay, so we're at two ninety eight here. Let me um, let me show you how to get there mathematically um, through a formula. The formula, the trick is that the future value of an annuity due, which is what we're trying to calculate here, equals the future value of an ordinary annuity, which, which, we, which is what we did a few minutes ago, times the 1.06. In other words, I'm taking, it's as though I am taking the entire annuity here, moving it forward and compounding it one extra period. So it's as though this is the ordinary new where the payments are delayed. And if I take those payments and I just compound them by one whole extra period, because I basically shifted everything to, if I shifted everything to the left, then all I need to do is compound it one extra period, so to speak, that whole balance. So I compound that whole balance at 6%. Uh, percent. And so what I get is, Look, 281.855, that came from the formula I showed you earlier, which is payment times 1 plus i to the n minus 1 over i. So there's your formula. Then you just multiply it 1 plus i, in this case 6%, and you get 298.766. Okay, so that's the trick. Um, or you can just go to your calculator and make sure that you have, you're in begin mode and you're going to hit n equals 5, payment equals uh, 50. You can put it in as negative so it pops out as a positive. Your interest rate, 6%, present value, 0, compute future value. And it'll be the future value of a beginning annuity, and that will come 298.766. Okay, now this future value, I think, is um, especially when you see me map it all out like I did here, it's fairly intuitive. Future money, when you invest money in an account, it snowballs, it just accumulates over time. And that compounding of money, that, that, is, that is the secret to finance, is the compounding of money. And so we need to take advantage of that. And that's where you, uh, a long horizon for investing. So you start investing if you can. I know it's very hard. I mean, not when I was in my 20s, I, had, I didn't have any money to invest. But I wish I did, because if I had something, it would have accumulated into something huge um, as, I got old, as I got older. So the point is, if you can, try to save something, even if it's small, because it'll accumulate to something big. And I only went 30 years. If, if you know, Somebody in their early 20s has a life expectancy of, of well over 80. You know, right now, it'd be your life expectancy is in the mid-80s. It'll be probably much higher um, in 40 years from now. So um, you, the N of 30 that I had earlier for retirement, that, that's too short. You could probably go N of 30. And a 50, and you're talking 50 years of compounding. It's huge, huge. Okay, let's go to present value of a lump sum. Okay, so present value of a lump sum. This is not too bad. It's just the reverse. We're rewinding. So you have a imagine the snowball accumulates to a, a large future value. You have a small present value and a large future value. That's how, how it typically works. Now, what happens if you're given a future value and want to compute a present value? It's basically taking that snowball and rewinding it. Um, so maybe you take a video of a snowball accumulating as you, you're making a snowman. Think about the, running the video backwards, and that's what present value is about. So remember, the formula that we had earlier was the future value equals the present value times 1 plus i to the n. Now what we're doing, and we solve for future value, what we want to do is solve for present value. So what we do is we divide both sides by this component. 
So future value divided by 1 plus i to the n equals present value. And so we take the future value divided by 1 plus n, you make that future value smaller, and that pops out as the present value. Okay, let's do an example. Okay, four years from now, you will need to purchase a new car and do not want an auto loan. The expected price of the car four years from now is $35,000. If you decide to invest an amount today that will grow to $35,000 in four years, how much do you need to invest today, given that the account pays 4%? Okay, so start throwing the, the data that's given into, you know, you're going to need an N, you're going to need a PV, so just in general, you need these. You need five elements, five things to fill in. Well, four things to fill in, and the fifth is always the, the question. So it's asking you, how much do you need today? That's the question. How much do you need to put in the account today? What is the present value? Because you know what the future value is. You need, in four years, you need 35000 bucks. So you can think of that as, you can put it in as negative, and putting it in as negative just means you're going to withdraw 35000 The interest rate is for, um, what was the interest rate? 4%. Okay. Um, and in this case, there is no payments. There's no indication of payments anywhere. The payment is zero. You're just putting in a lump sum today that grows to $35,000, growing at a 4% interest rate. So this balance grows at 4%. That's what the interest rate is. And it's over four years. So the simple math is the present value. Um, so if you did this and calculated on your, on your calculator, you'll get 29918 Okay, Try that actually do that in your calculator, or 35,000 divided by 1.04 to the fourth power is 29,918. Now, how do I interpret that? Well, I interpret it this way. Drop in, deposit $29,918 today, and in four years at a 4% interest rate, you'll have $35,000 to be able to pay for the car. Okay. So you're going to, you know, you can, um, now it, it doesn't, you could put this in as a positive and let this come out as a negative. It doesn't matter. You'll be able to interpret, look, you need 35,000 and you're going to need to, you're going to need to deposit 29,000 today. So think of it that way. Again, don't worry too much about the signs. For the most part, you'll be able to interpret it based on the context of the question. The, the que it becomes a little harder, and you'll see a little later on, it becomes a little harder when you have to put both a, a present value, a future value, or and a, and a payment all in there. you got to make sure you got the signs right then. Um, and I'll show you as, as the problem, uh, when the problem pops up. Now, what happens if the interest rate instead is four, instead of 4%, let's say it's 9.2%, just making up a number, 9.2%. Do the calculations, put in 9.2%, you'll get 22,540%, or $22,540. So you, you, only, you only have to deposit $22,540 to get your $35,000 back are out of your account in four years. Why? Because your account is growing at 9.2%, a much higher growth rate. So you have to put less money in for it to snowball. Okay? If your snowball accumulates at the 9.2% much faster, you know, your snowball will get to a certain balance by a certain size. You know, you, you have to start pretty small, it doesn't basically. Now if interest rates are really, really low like they are in today's environment, you're not going to get much compounding. You're going to have to put in like $34,000 or more in an account, and it's barely going to grow because interest rates are so little, less than 1%. So um, you're not going to get much out of your bank accounts. And that's one of the problems with today's environment 
In today's business environment with the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates low, savers uh, and people who deposit money in certificates of deposits, in bank accounts, in money market accounts, they're earning interest rates that are very, very low. They're not getting much. And so there's very little reward to saving, which can have a negative impact on the economy if there's, no, if there's very little savings going on. If you raise the interest rate that banks will pay, there'll be more savings and more loanable funds flowing in, into, the, into the market. Right now, the Fed is basically the one supplying the credit to the markets, and it's not private investors, private savers. Okay, so let's look at a formula now. Oh, let's look. Let me see here. Oh, we want to go to a present present value. That was a present value of a lump sum I just covered. Let's do the present value of an annuity. Okay. Present value of an annuity. Ordinary annuity. Okay, which means the payments are happening at the end. So the present value of an ordinary annuity over n periods equals your payment times 1 minus 1 over 1 plus i to the n. And by the way, I'll give you a formula sheet on the exam. You don't have to memorize these formulas. I will give you a formula sheet supply it with you. And it'll look, the formulas will look just like this, just like I'm showing you. Um, you'll, ha you'll have a financial calculator. It can't be, a, a, it can't be the, your phone. Your phone is unacceptable as a, as a financial calculator, even though there are financial calculating apps. I know that. I've seen them. But you can't use them, obviously, because you're connected to the, to the world then. Um, it's, but you can bring in a financial calculator. You can have a BA2 plus or any other calculator as a financial mode. Or like I say, I keep telling you, technically you don't need a financial calculator. You can you can get by without one, but it's a, it's harder. Okay, let's do an example of a present value of an ordinary annuity. Congratulations, you just won the lottery again. The Lottery Commission gives you a choice. Take an annuity to $25,000 at the end of each year for five years or $100,000 today. So as soon as you see that word today, it tells you you're at the timeline component, at the, at the zero part, part of the timeline. And so it's telling you, look, just twenty-five thousand dollars in an annuity payments at the end of each year for five years. Okay, so right here, payment twenty-five thousand dollars. Right, n is five. The interest rate is going to be. So here's the rest of the question: Is what is your decision if interest rates are six percent? So there it is, six percent. So we got three out of the four we need. Okay, so what else do we need? We have that. We have a present value of $100,000. Okay, so now um, it's not asking, it's not asking, by the way, look at this problem. It's not asking for a future value. The future value is zero, by the way. Um, so what this problem is doing is it's saying, look, how much, of, what is the value of this annuity versus the present value of $100 or $100,000? So maybe I, sh I shouldn't, maybe it's a little confusing. I, we don't want to put this into the calculator yet. Okay? What we want to do is we want to compare this annuity to this $100,000, which this $100,000, it, it is a present value term because it's today you have a, you got your choice of getting $100,000 or $25,000 over the next five years. Okay, so let's do the calculation and it'll become apparent. So here's the present value of an annuity for n periods. Put a little five there if you want. And it's 25,000. One minus one. To the fifth. All over 0.06. 
and added this whole thing is 4.212. So this comes out to be 105.309. Okay. So the present value of this annuity that you're getting, okay, is 109 is 105.309. Okay. Now, that's the form. This the formula. Compare that to the 100,000. What would you rather have? today would you rather get one hundred thousand dollars in cash in your hand or getting an annuity that's worth a hundred and five thousand dollars the answer is you'd rather have the annuity assuming away any risk say the, the risk is the same for each you know you're getting money from the state so the state's got to be around in a couple in the next five years so you don't have to worry about risk so you'd rather get the annuity is what this is saying so pick the annuity now let's Let's get the intuition behind this stuff here. And by the way, if you plugged in this, this payment of 25, N is 5, and I slash Y is 6%, future value of 0, you will get a present value from that annuity of 105,309. So check that in your calculator. You shouldn't have a problem with that. Let's look at the intuition for a moment. So we're going to have a timeline. It's five years, and you're going to get twenty-five thousand. Chop the zeros off. I don't want to write them out. And it's asking, what is the value of this annuity right here today? Because the state's sitting with a hundred thousand dollars and saying, "Look, I'll give you this or a hundred thousand dollars right here." What do you want? So we're going to calculate the present value of this simply by taking the present value of each cash flow. So this cash flow, what's it worth today? This is 25000 one year from now is not the same as what $25,000 is worth today. So how do you go about working with that? Well, you take 25 and divide it by 1.06 to the end, one, one period. So this is worth 23.585. Okay. In other words, if you invest 23,000 at 6% for one year, it'll be worth 25,000 in, in one year. Now, take this payment and discount it for two periods. 25 divided by 1.06 squared and you get to 22.250 keep doing this keep doing it and when you add this all up you'll have 105 309 so verify that you can do that. It's a great opportunity now to stop the video. Make sure you can do these calculations and it adds up to 105. And make sure you can do it on your calculator. Now when you do this on your calculator, don't forget this is an ending annuity. So flip it out of the BGN because if you look at your calculator, you're going to see a BGN up in the, up in the screen in the right hand corner. Get rid of that by say second begins second set. And you'll get this out because you want an ending. And when there's an ending, it doesn't have it doesn't say E N D anywhere on your screen because that's the default mode. The world of finance assumes that an ordinary annuity is one where the payments occur at the end of the period. Okay. So that was an ordinary present value of an ordinary annuity. Now, what happens with the present value of an annuity due or in advance? So let's make sure we cover that while we're here. So let's look at the timeline again. So this will be ordinary, this will be due or advance. Okay, with an ending annuity, you get payments here, as I just showed you. 
But with a new annuity due, I'm asking what is the present value here for payments that start today? But they have to have the same N. So here's here's the um, here, here's the last cash flow because that's one, two, three, four, five, the fifth cash flow. There's no cash flow right here. So it's asking what is the present value here? Well, the formula for that is the present value of an annuity due equals the present value of an annuity ordinary, that's ordinary, n minus 1. So I should say present value of an annuity due for n periods, in this case it's 5, equals the present value of an ordinary annuity for one less period plus a payment. And let me explain that. Notice, if I was to cover this one payment up with my finger, this annuity, these two annuities, right, this, this annuity right here is really the, or a ordinary annuity for four periods, right? It's an ordinary annuity for not just five periods, but five minus one here plus add this last payment, so this last payment right here is coming in. There it is. And this is the present value of this, which is the present value of an ordinary annuity for not five periods, but five minus one. One, two, three, four periods. Okay, And so that's what the present value of an annuity do. That's the trick to get there. I sometimes call it toggling. You're toggling between an ordinary and, 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 and one in advance or due. And the present value trick is you add the payment. With the future value, you take one plus the interest rate and compound the whole thing forward to snowball at one period. Here, you, you're, you're truncating the series, and then you add this last payment, because this last payment doesn't get any compounding. When you have anything to the zero power, because the time period is zero here, there's no time to invest money. There's no compounding the payment is worth the payment. So there's no time effects on this payment term here. So when you do that, and um, you, you put this into your calculator, or let's actually work this before we go any further. So this will be 25,000 See my 4? N minus 1 is 4.06 plus 25,000 gives me um, 111,627. Okay, 111. Look, you'd rather get your payment sooner rather than later. So it's worth a bit more. You're getting paid, you know, everything shifted back a year with the annuity, ordinary annuity. But with the present value, you're happy because you get your money right up front. And so um, it's worth 111. So you get an extra 6,000 out of it, which is good. So you ought to be able to do this in your calculator. Again, make sure that you hit second begin, then second set enter to make sure that it's a beginning annuity and it has that little BGN up there. And hit your hit your. You know, n equals 5, i slash y equals 6. Present value is what you're going to compute, so let's not do that yet. Payment is 25,000. Uh, what's What am I missing? Future value is 0. We have no future value. And you're going to hit compute present value, and that will pop 111,627. Okay. Now, let's look at a, a slightly strange type of annuity. Okay, so basically what I did was I covered, I just covered the nuts and bolts of the chapter. By far the most important four components, the present value of a, of a lump sum, the present value of an annuity, future value of a lump sum, future value of an annuity. Extremely important. You're going to need to know those. Because think about it. Just just think for one second. Remember I told you that the value of any asset depends on its cash flows. And so since we're living in a world where there's interest rates, then 
the, the value of any asset is the present value of its future cash flows. So if you have a stock, for example, then you take the present value of all the dividends you expect. That's the value of the stock because that's the cash flow the stock will pay. If you take the, the value of a bond, a bond pays off coupon interest. Take the present value of that coupon interest and, and you have the value of your bond. Now, you got to get into the idiosyncrasies of stocks and bonds and that's what later chapters are about. So we have entire chapters on how to value stocks and bonds later on. But it's nothing but an application of this chapter five, time value of money. So now with a stock, keep in mind that a stock never matures, right? And uh, there's also some bonds out there in the world that never mature. They're, they're, they're called perpetuities. A perpetuity is a constant stream of cash flow that goes into infinity. So let's assume we have a stock that pays a constant dividend forever or a bond that pays a constant coupon forever. We're going to assume uh, annual like we have. Uh, and so we want to ask, what is the present value of that perpetuity? These are called perpetuities. Perpetuity. Stream of cash flows, constant cash flow. In other words, the cash flow doesn't grow out to infinity. It turns out that the present value, well, think about it. Before I tell you what the present value is, think about it for one second. You have this asset that gives you cash forever. Hmm. It goes out to infinity. Should this be worth infinity? Should the present value of a stock that pays a constant payment forever be worth? It turns out to not to be the, the answer. The present value is not infinity. It turns out that those future cash flows, say you get a cash flow 50, 60, 70 years from now, which is nowhere near infinity, those cash flows, when you discount them back to today's value, those are future value amounts that you're getting, they're almost worthless. The, you know, you're rewinding the snowball, and the snowball, by the time you're done rewinding it, it's the size of a, an, an electron or an atom. It's itty bitty. And so the cash flows, you know, think about it. If you're going to get $100 100 years from now, what is, what is it worth today? Well, that $100 that you're going to get 100 years from now is worth, like, practically worthless. It's, it's so little, you, it won't even fit in a penny. It won't even work with a penny, probably, depending on the interest rate. So you can do that calculation quite easily um, now that you know present value. So here, the formula is the payment for perpetuity divided by I. That's it. I's got to be in decimal form. And so um, an example of a perpetuity in terms of a bond is a British consul. In the UK, the, the, the UK has issued bonds that last forever in some cases. And so the value of the bond is not infinity, but the value of the bond, let's say the bond pays a 20 pays $25 per year forever. And let's say the world of the interest rate environment now is 4%. That means the bond is worth $625 today. The value of annuity. So, what is $25 per year forever worth in an environment where interest rates stay constant at 4%, it's worth $625. So if you wanted to sell this bond, you'd be selling the bond for 625 bucks. Okay, now we have assumed annual compounding and by far it's the simplest way to do it. Interest rates are almost always on an annual basis. The interest rates that are disclosed, nominal interest rates, are almost always annualized. And so that's what I've been assuming, and your textbook assumes all the interest rates that I had in the pro previous problems, including right here, was an annual interest rate. But you know the world is a little more complicated than that. There is, um, There are institutions that pay interest monthly, pay interest quarterly. There's loans and other assets that, that uh, have interest payments that are quarterly, monthly. It's possible even to have daily. It's possible even to have an infinite number of time periods and uh, infinite compounding. We're not going to go into that. 
um, at least not here at this point, uh, but that's called continuous compounding. So we need to understand the mechanism for dealing with uh, um, the, the math for dealing with this interperiod compounding. So let's look at semi-annual and other compounding periods. And so here's the formula, basically, that you need to know. So I'll give it to you um, in, a, in a lump sum formula here. So here we take the future value, okay, over n periods is going to equal present value times 1 plus i over m all over n times m. Okay, so write that down. And by the way, you should be writing all of this down to help it solidify in, in your minds how, how this works. You, you, as I've been saying, you don't want to just watch this video. You got to write it down and keep, keep up with me with pencil and paper. Okay, so what did we do here? Well, remember th that the present, uh, the future value of a basic annuity was this on an annual basis. That was the annual basis. Now, what I've done was I've chopped this. I in the pieces, M pieces. That's what I'm doing. I'm chopping the I in the M pieces and I'm multiplying the number of years by M pieces. M is the number of periods per year. It's the number of periods per year. So if it's quarterly, it's four. If it's monthly, it's 12. If it's daily, it's 365. I think you get it. So what we're doing is we're chopping the interest rate into a periodic rate, sometimes called a periodic rate, this whole term right here. And then we're, we, if we chop it, say, by into four pieces, put m equals four, then we have to say we have four compounding periods. So it's one year equals four compounding periods. So you're taking this to the fourth power. Okay. Um, let me give you some examples of how to work this. Let's say you have a $5,000 balance on your credit card. $5,000 balance. Okay, your credit card. That's, that's what it's worth today. That's a present value. And it's going to take a little while when you, for you to get comfortable with these ideas of what is a present value, what's a future value. You're going to look at problems, you're going to scratch your head, and you're not going to know what they are. It takes some experience to get used to what is a present value or future value. But if I say currently you have a credit card balance of $5,000, that word currently signals that that's today. And so you have a present value. Okay. Now, it has a stated interest rate. And by the way, this interest rate here is often called a stated interest rate. This I is often called the stated interest rate. Um, sometimes it's called the APR, the annual percentage rate. And so the formula I'm showing you is consistent with the way credit card companies are required to compute interest. Okay, there's, they can't compute it, and there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways you, and assumptions that you can make, but they've got to calculate it somehow, some way related to this formula. So, again, back to the problem. You currently have $5,000 in your credit card balance, stated interest of 18 percent, okay, your I slash Y, that's your annual percentage rate, that's the interest rate that credit cards advertise, read the fine print, they call them APRs, annual percentage rate, it's an annual interest rate, okay, now, assuming that you make no payments for, a, for the first year, what will be your balance at the end of the year if interest is compounded annually, semi-annually, quarterly, and daily? Okay, so <clears throat> let's take a look at it. So we're going to take the 5,000 and we're going to grow it by 1 plus the 18, that's the annual percentage rate, 18% in decimal form, divide it by 1. So this is annual and taking it one year compounded by one period gives you $5,900. So that basically transmits into 
$900 in interest income that you're going to pay for that $5,000. Now, what? that's if they compound annually. But I can tell you, there's no credit cards out there that compound annually. They want to zap you for as much as they can. So they jack this interest rate up as high as the law will allow them and compound it out as much as they possibly can to rake you over the coals. So let's say quarterly, and I don't think there's there is very many that are quarterly, but let's just do the calculation. So it's 1 plus the 18 divided by 4. So this interest rate, this this rate right here, this periodic rate, 18 divided by 4, that's 4.5%. Four 4.5% four per quarter is what it's saying, right? It's 4.5%. And then it's one year times four periods. So this is $5,000. $904.50. If you did it uh, monthly, so you have a monthly somewhere. I'll do the calculation monthly. Five, which is more appropriate, more common, I should say, in, in the credit card world. You're going to chop that interest rate into 1.5% per month, but you're going to compound it over 12 months. Okay, 1.05. You're going to get, it's going to cost you another, compared to annual, it's going to cost you another $78.09 a year by that monthly compounding. And if you did it daily, it would even it would go up a bit more. But most of the compounding effects take place within the first, if you compound monthly to the 12th power. Once you compound, say, to the 24th power, to the 30th power, to the 40th power, um, you don't get much of a, a, an increase. So you got a $40 increase, and then you got less than a $40, a $38. It, it dies out fairly quickly. So typically, monthly is where it goes to. Now, so that's the math, for example, for a credit card. Now, let's look at being able to compare interest rates um, and, and use the terminology. What we want to do is focus in on these guys right here. Focus in on this stuff. That's the interest rate. Get rid of the balances, and that's where we're going here. Let's look at comparing interest rates. So let's look at what's called the effective annual rate, sometimes it's E, F, F, or effective annual rate, year, and that is calculated by taking 1 plus the I to the M period, right, and then there's an implicitly a 1 because we're looking at an annual basis, that means the 1, right, there's the 1 right here. All right, there's the 1, times M. Subtract 1 out, because we added this one, we've got to subtract this one. And that's the effective annual interest rate. So on a quarterly basis, in the problem we just saw, what is the actual, what was the effective interest rate of this problem right here? It wasn't 18%. It was not the effective rate. 18% is if the effective rate if you compounded only once a year. What was that interest rate, right? It's not 18%. Let's calculate it. 18 divided by 4 to the 4th power minus 1 gives me 0.1952. Okay? So the interest rate that's embedded in here in this calculation is not the 18%, because 18% gets you to, to a balance that you owe of 5900 here you owe 5940 It's really 19.5%, a little over 19.5% interest rate. And if you wanted to do this on an annual basis, you would come up with not as much as you think, as I was telling you before. You'd come up with about 19.7%. 
uh, is the effective, the actual interest rate that, that you are paying. But so remember, the, the law states that the APR has a limit in many cases around 18%, and the credit card company is right up against that. But in, in most cases that I know of, there's no limit on how much you can continue, you can compound. So really, the 18% is really close to 20% in some cases, 19.5%-ish, somewhere around there. Okay, now let's do an example. Assume you borrow $1,000 from a credit card company today with an APR of 18% compounded monthly. So the present value is 1,000. Um, I slash Y, which is the same as I here, it's the annual percentage rate, is 18%. Okay. Assume that you don't make any payments. What would be your balance after three years? Okay, what would be your balance after three years? Well, put that into the formula. Here's your thousand. One plus point one eight divided by twelve. We have monthly payments. Okay, let's assume monthly compounding. So it's going to be. Um, n years times 12, right? And this n equals 3 years. So the number of compounding, the, the number of months in 3-year period is 36. That's what that's telling you right here on this exponent. It's 36. So that's the same as saying 1,000 times 1 point, um, 195. Five six that would be compounding on a monthly basis. That would be the interest rate, right? Times one point one nine five six. That's the effective annual rate on a monthly basis. Okay, that's one plus point one eight to the twelfth to the twelfth power here, and you keep doing that for the um, for three years. Oops, I'll just do it out. When we're done, we have 17.09 and 9 cents, which is the same here as 17.09. I got 14 cents. It's due to rounding. I just have rounding, so you compound things. Um, you get some rounding. I'm not worried about when you're looking at $1,700 and you're off by 6 cents. Nickel, doesn't matter. Um, so you got to use your judgment there. There's rounding, and especially when you when you truncate numbers and you're compounding out 20 or 30 years, that truncation it gets compounded for 20 or 30 years. Just be aware of that. And so you don't want to truncate too much because then you get an answer that's pretty sloppy. So there's your there's the answer to your to the problem. This, again, the problem was assume you borrow a thousand dollars from a credit card company with an APR of 18 percent. Monthly compounding. Okay, you don't make any payments, so payments are basically zero. N equals three. How much do you owe at the end? Well, you're going to owe seventeen hundred nine dollars. You're going to owe seven hundred. It's going to accumulate seven hundred nine dollars in interest over that time period. Okay. Now, the last thing that we want to cover in this chapter, in this video, is amortized loans. Extremely important. Extremely important because mortgages, auto loans, student loans, bank loans, some bank loans, some bank loans, um, and other assorted we sometimes call them in finance credit instruments, um, meaning fixed income type securities, are amortizing loans. And so we need to know what that means. Well, an amortizing loan means that when you make payments, not only are you paying for the interest, like I have been showing you in some cases, but also principal. So your payments are composed of principal, plus interest. So when you make a mortgage payment or your parents make a mortgage payment, typically what's happening is they're making a payment towards principal to reduce their principal 
and it's all they're also paying off the interest for the month. And so amortizing loans are good because it reduces the good from the bank's perspective. It reduces the risk of default because if you're continuously paying off, you, you know, say you get a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage. If you're continuously paying off the principal, you don't have a lump sum due of two hundred thousand dollars in principal thirty years from now. So when you're amortizing loans, the principal gets paid down along with interest. So the the bank always gets its interest, but it's also getting a piece of the principal. And so that principal reduces to the point of zero at the end of the mortgage. So you're at the end of the line on the mortgage. There's no balance left to compute interest. So you have, all, um, you know, basically very, very little interest expense at the end of the 30 years. The interest expense is huge up front in the first few payments because your balance is huge. So what we want to do is we want to put together a amortized loan schedule is really what we're doing here and sometimes if you took an accounting course you might have seen something like this because in accounting you're interested in um, let me see if I can put that somewhere here sometimes in, in, in a um, accounting course here's, here's your balance sheet if a company's lent money it has um, assets, liabilities, and equity, it wants to be able to put down on its liabilities the present value of, of their loans. What is the present value of, uh, of the money that they owe? Or even in this case, the present value, if they lent money, it's, a, it's, it's an asset. If they owe money, it's a liability. But in either case, you got to book and put on the books the present value. So that's uh, an application from from accounting, but here we're, we're also we're interested in the financial concepts uh, and how how all this works. So let me give you an example, and we'll actually do a table. Okay, here's the example. You're going to borrow a hundred thousand. Okay, five years. N is five. Right, ten percent mortgage, ten percent interest rate. And this is going to be annual now. It's just, it's just too, you know, I'll steer away and go to annual as much as I can so that you get the intuition. You, what happens is if you, go, if you go monthly, like the real world, you lose the intuition by getting tangled up in the math. And so I'm going to sh shove aside that real world implication and do the calculations on an annual basis so it's clean and you get the intuition of how these mortgages are working. And, and other other securities, by the way, other things, other loans. Okay, so again, this is you borrow $100,000 for five years at 10%. The payment schedule calls for equal payments at the end of each period. So we know it's an ordinary type annuity. Payments are at the end of each period. Interest is computed based on the beginning of the year. So the dollar amount of interest. So I'll put a dollar dollar amount of interest that's due is computed at the beginning of the year principal. Dollar interest is computed from beginning balance. That's important to know. So it's the balance at the beginning of the period that is used to calculate the interest that's due. And so you can calculate the payments. So the first thing is, what the heck are your monthly payments or your annual payments? That's what you need to know first off in order to build this schedule. I'll show you two ways. I'm going to show you mathematically and then how to bang it out on your calculator. So <clears throat> we are looking at um, this $100,000 is what you're borrowing. That's a present value. So we're going to look at this formula. Present value equals payment, oops, it's a minus, here's the formula that I showed you for the present value of an annuity, right here, plug the numbers in, and we're going to solve for payment, so this is a hundred thousand dollars, 
This is 10% 10, uh, 10 for five periods over 0 0.10. And then, so this whole thing, when you solve, payment equals, oh, this whole thing in brackets is 3.791, by the way. Payment equals 26, 379.75. These you just solve for payment mathematically. That's not too bad. On your calculator, let's confirm it. Because when, you, when it comes to a test, you have the ability to use this formula, which didn't take me more than a couple seconds to calculate, right? Then you can back it up on your calculator. Because let me tell you, and you already know this, but when you start banging numbers into your calculator, and numbers start flying out, and you're looking at them, and you don't have context for it, you don't know if the answer is right or wrong or, you know, am I far off? So you should have a way to back up and verify your answers. This math that I just showed you does that. But you want to confirm that sometimes your math by hand will give you, you know, you, it's easy to make a mistake. Easy. So confirm with the calculator. So I slash Y is 10. Uh, N is 5 years. The present value is, and we could put it in as a if we put it in as negative 100,000, the payments will come out positive. Um, if you put this as positive, the payments will come out negative, and you'll be able to interpret it. The future value is zero because I haven't given you anything. It's not part of the problem. You're going to compute payment. If you do that, out will pop 26,379.75. Hmm. Okay, that's great. Two different ways to compute it. Now we want to go one step further and get the intuition as to what's going on underlying this in terms of principal and interest. So what you're going to see is that your interest expense, even though the payments are fixed in the mortgage, and in this example the payments are going to be fixed at 26379 each year for five years, the amount that's allocated to interest and the amount that's allocated to principal will vary. The principal balance will start going up because the interest will drop. So your payment, this payment here is made up of principal and interest. And over time, since your balance overall drops, your interest expense drops, which means each payment contributes more and more to principal, which is exactly why and it's extremely important for you to realize that if you can double up early on on your principal payments in a mortgage, so you're, when you first start out at a 30-year mortgage, the principal payments are really small. It's almost all interest. All you got to do is, you know, if your mortgage bill is um, two thousand dollars a month, all you need to do is make a twenty-one hundred dollar a month payment, for example, or maybe a, a two thousand and twenty-five dollar payment, and you will have basically doubled the principal that you're paying because the principal is very small; it could be a hundred. $25 or whatever. And so if you double up on the principal, you'll pay your loan off so much faster and save yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest expense by doing that. By that little tip, double up, triple up if you can on, on, the, on the principal payments early. And in the state of Maine, you're allowed to make those principal payments. You're allowed to pay down your mortgage early. So nobody, you know, I shouldn't say nobody, very few people hold a mortgage for 30 years. In fact, we look at 10-year interest rates in this class, in my economic class, in my investment class, in my derivatives class. We look at 10-year interest rates, treasury rates, as a benchmark rate um, in a lot of applications. And why do we look at the 10-year rate? Because interest rates for mortgages are based off of 10-year treasuries. Why 10 years? Because a 30-year mortgage never lasts 30 years on average. Most people pay down their they pay down or either sell their house or pay down their mortgage early, and so the average mortgage lasts about 10 years, which is why they look at 10-year bonds to price mortgages. <clears throat> okay, enough of that. Let's actually put together a table. So I'm going to build a table, and I'm going to have year at the top. I am going to have beginning balance, I'm going to have payment, I'm going to have interest payments, and then I'm going to have um, repay, and that's the repayment of principal. 
And then I'm going to have an ending balance. I'm running out of room here. Okay, so we're going to start out one, two, three, four, five periods. So I'm going to build this table. And the very first number that goes in is at the beginning of year one. You can draw a timeline out if you want. The beginning of year one, the balance is $100,000. That's the present value. And we just computed the payments. $26,379.75 for year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. We just calculated that. That's easy. Now, the interest expense, I told you how to calculate the interest. Take the beginning balance, multiply it by the interest rate. So take $100,000, multiply it by the 10% interest rate, and the interest for the first year is $10,000 in interest expense for this. Now this is a very short mortgage, it's only five years. So when it's a short mortgage for five years, um, you're gonna to have to be paying this principal back pretty quickly. So the principal payments will be pretty big on a five year mortgage. A 30 year, the principal payments will be small. So how much are you paying back in principal? The difference. If your payment is 26,000 and you paid 10,000 in interest, that means 16,000 379.75 has to have gone to pay back principal. So your ending balance is now this 100,000 minus the 16. Your ending balance is 83,620.25. Carry that guy right up over to 83,620.25. You still have the same payment of 26,379. Interest now is a function of your beginning balance times 10%. So it's 10% times the 83,000, 8,362.03. Which means if you made a $26,000 payment and interest was 8,300, the difference between these two numbers had to be 18,017.73 pays back the principal. So your ending balance now, subtract this 18,000 off, 65. 602. Um, I have 50, I'm thinking of 52. It could be a 32. I think it's a 52. Okay, that's your beginning balance for the next year. So your ending balance is your beginning balance for the year later. 52. Multiply that by 10%. That's your interest expense. That's 6560. 25, the difference between your 26 and your 6,000 is 19,819.50. And so your ending balance, subtract that 19,000 off, 45,783.02. And I'll finish the rest, but you ought to be able to do this on your own. In fact, I'll just put this as 45,783.02. And then this becomes 23,981.57. Okay, and when you're all said and done, if you've done this correctly, so I've given you hints on how to finish the rest of it right here, this number has to be zero. So you basically, when you build this table, you know the answer has to be, this number better be zero and in English, that means you've paid off the mortgage and you owe nothing. So you have an ending balance of zero after five years. Okay. Now, one other little trick here is what happens if this was a, an annuity due? What is the mortgage where your first payment was due today rather than one year from now? So I'll just give you the basic math on that. So present value of annuity due equals the present value of an annuity, and that's after n years. This is n minus 1 for ordinary plus the payment. So mathematically, the present value stays the same. You still owe $100,000 at the beginning, but you need to calculate this number. So really what you're doing is you're solving for payment. So you got one equation with one unknown. And so this whole 
thing turns out to be 3.17 here and solve for payment payment turns out to be 23,981.59. Ah, which is less than the 26,000 we were dealing with up here earlier, right? Why? Because you, if you can, if you can talk your bank or your mortgage company, you probably won't be able to do this. But if you could talk them into making your payments at the beginning of the period rather than at the end of each month or at the end of each year in this case, you can save yourself some money, like I've been telling you. Make your payment, if, if you make your payments early, the payments will actually be less because you won't have to be paying all that interest expense on the balance for that by delaying for one period. So you can calculate this on your calculator. Go to second begin, second set, put in, um, an interest rate of 10%, N equals 5, present value of 100,000, future value 0, compute payment, and you'll get 23,981.59. So that concludes this video on time value of money. And I've basically given you all, I think, nearly everything you need to know for time value of money. Um, now what I'll do in the next videos is I'll supply you with some problems. That, are, that can be quite complex. The world of time value, you know, time value of money and finance, the world, it can be quite complex. But if you understand these calculations, understand them, don't try to memorize them, understand what's going on here, you'll have the tools you need to answer those more complex problems. Because I'm telling you, the problems will become more complex and it'll be almost impossible to understand them if you just memorize what's going on because the context of the problems change from problem to problem the wording will be different and that's the world the world's problems are are set out and laid out different types of languages you need to translate that into exactly what I'm showing you in this video translate it and then you'll be able to come up with the solutions it will take a bit of studying so you want to put your time up front early as they say and the pun is invest early in this and you'll get reap rewards um, because eventually you know at the first week or two you may not understand this material but if you work at it it'll sink in and then it'll click something will click somewhere along the way and most of what I'm saying will make sense and then a little bit of studying here and there patch up the places you're a little off on and you'll be okay but you wait for that point to click and you'll be in good shape